Ciao ragazzi! This is Katie Portanova, and you're listening to Florence and Me. I'm a lover of stories and all things Italian, and I'm going to bring you all that in this podcast. My intention is to inspire you to step out of your comfort zone and explore life and travel the world. Join me as I tell you my story and many others about Italy and my love, Florence. Andiamo! Ciao ragazzi! Hi, it's Katie. It's my first podcast um, episode. Welcome to Florence and Me. This podcast um, is just going to be my way of expressing my complete love of Florence and Italy and everything in between. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself um, before I go further into my journeys abroad. I first came in contact with Italy from my grandma. Maria. Maria Iori. And she never taught us any Italian, but I always had something deep down inside of me that I really wanted to go abroad, and I didn't know it until um, I went to college and had the opportunity of going to study, to study abroad in Florence. Now, let me take you back to 2001. So I was a junior. No, I was a sophomore. Yes, a sophomore. uh, Oh, no, I was a junior. Sorry. Yes, I was a junior (laughs) at St. Mary's University in Winona, Minnesota. Um, I had heard of the study abroad program from another fellow soccer player on our Cardinals team, Katie Lentz, who is now Katie Bunker. Um, and she and her, um, bunch of friends went the year before and told me how amazing it was, um, my fall semester at, uh, St. Mary's in 2001. So, of course, I inquired about it, um, and got all the information. And then, as we all know, 9-11 happened and I was very nervous. Um, I didn't know if we were going to be able to go. In total, there were about 22 people, 22 students that signed up for the study abroad in the spring of 2002. And by the time 9-11 happened, there were only 12 of us that remained. And from what I could um, gather from my own intuition and also asking family members, my mother, like, how, how do you feel? about me going, everyone was like, it should be the safest time to go. So I got my ticket. I left in January of 2002 on my way to Florence all by myself for an eight hour flight. And the only other two people I knew was two other students, um, CJ, if you ever listen to this, I miss you. And Emily as well, miss you too. Um, both from Chicago. Actually, CJ was from Missouri. Yes. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so we embarked on this trip. We had met at the airport prior to going, um, getting onto the flight, got to meet CJ's parents and Emily and I were somewhat close in the plane, but I remember being really, really nervous. I remember being, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. I'm doing this by myself. Um, it was, it was a big eye opener for me. And, um, yeah. So by the time we landed very much jet lagged, cause I don't think I slept from what I can remember. Um, we get off the flight, we get into a cab, the three of us, and it was crazy. I, I want to paint this picture for you. So we get off at the Florence airport Um, and we got into a cab, we had the address, of course we didn't know how to say it, but we gave the address to the taxi driver, um, put all our bags in the, in the car and we go off. 
Now, the traffic in Florence, in Italy in general, in any big city, is quite chaotic. There is no such thing as turn signals. There's no such thing as, um, there's just no such thing as stopping. Like, there's no complete stops, I'll be honest. I remember feeling completely scared out of my mind um, in the car because I did not, it was like, boom, boom, side to side, side to side, and... And I had no idea exactly where we were going because I looked up where we stayed, um, Fiesole. I looked it up, but I didn't know it was like on top of a hill that I didn't know. So we kept going up and up and up. Me and Emily, I just had met her. I'm like, oh my God, where are we going? This is crazy. And we get to the tiny, tiny, tiny little road that leads up to this little villa, Villa Bonelli. And... I didn't even think the taxi could get in because it literally was like I could touch the wall as I as we drove up. We get out, we get to meet Simone for the first time, who became a really close friend of mine and his family. One of the managers, um, we get into our room. Emily and I actually were roommates, so we got to get to know each other a little better. So the journey that when we got there, all of us got there different times, and it was, we were all in culture shock. All we heard was Italian, no English, um, except from people, like, in our circles, and um, our director, Bob, who's amazing, and I learned so much from him. I became really close friends with him, and I really hope he's doing well. Um, so... The thing for me was, back then, this was, again, 2002, there were no cell phones, we had calling cards, Um, there was a tiny little grocery shop nearby, which we always, like, got, like, as much snacks as we wanted, we made really disgusting alcoholic drinks, which I'll get into, Um, yeah, so everything was literally something out of, not even a movie, because I've never, I've never, ever been in an authentic space like this and 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 hearing the language as I walked down the street the little old in nonni that they were carrying their bags up the hills of of Fiesole like hearing them speak I'm just like oh my god just my eyes were open my ears were open and I couldn't believe that I was actually there also another thing to note that we did not have we had an internet computer for us to use in the hotel, in the villa, but it was not very, it, it was like dial-up, probably, if you guys remember AOL, American Online for the young ones. Um, there was an internet cafe right down the street, which we all spent most of our times with, especially the guys that had girlfriends at home. They were there all the time. But again, I had no connection to the outside world apart from the internet, going to internet cafe, and the calling cards that my mom had given me. The rest was like, I'm a, I'm an explorer, man. I'm going to go, and I'm just going to go and explore this beautiful city, take the bus, walk everywhere, see everything, take as many pictures as I can. I was all in, like all in. Some of the other people on my in my study abroad were not, and they know who they are and they stayed in the villa played cards most of the times when we had free time which I did not so um I'm gonna start with what I had never the things I had never tasted or eaten before okay I had never tasted Italian wine okay again the restaurant we stayed we had dinner every night Probably wasn't the best wine now that I look back, but still, it was wine. It was red wine, white wine. We tried everything. Grappa, eh, Vinsanto. Like they, they, the restaurant really catered to the fact that we knew nothing about Italian culture and food and wine. And so each meal, we, we had what we had our schedule as is like we had classes during the day some the, some of them were at the villa some of them we met um Vera oh my god oh I could go on and on oh my gosh I gotta keep keep on track um 
So, but we always had dinner at the same restaurant, Perseos, in Fiesole, every night at 7 p.m. Okay, 7 p.m., you would think, oh my God, wow, that was really freaking late. No, that's like early, guys. We were the only ones in the restaurant. The restaurant really didn't start seeing people until 8, 8.30. Um, and we usually ate probably between, it was probably an hour, an hour and a half. So by the time we left, people were starting to come in to these, this restaurant. So every night, every night, every single night, um, I think except, no, every single night, maybe except Saturdays and Sundays. God, I can't remember. Oh my God, it's been so long. Um, we had a three course meal. We had an antipasto, an appetizer. We had pasta, primo, secondo, uh, some type of meat or fish, and a dessert. I guess it's a four-course meal. Um, And a whole shitload of bread, okay? Uh, I was talking to my sister the other day, and she's like, you literally gained 30 pounds when you're over there. And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty much I did, because long story, but my pants did not fit me by the end of that trip. Anyway, (laughs) but I enjoyed it. I like suck it. I I like drunk it in. I ate everything. I didn't say no. I just like took everything that was in front of me and I tried it. I tried octopus. I tried all different types of fish. I tried mussels. I tried clams. I tried everything. And they're all my favorite now. Anyway, so each meal was for me, I felt an extravaganza. Like I, I could not I I just couldn't believe that Italians ate like this. And then I come to know that not all Italians eat three course meals, four course meals every single day. But I was at that time, I was like enthralled by the fact that they were so fit and skinny and um, not obese like we are in the States. And they ate all this delicious food. Anyway, so that was one of my big things that I remember just the first taste, the first things I've I put it in my mouth and I'm like, oh my God, why didn't I ever taste this before? Why didn't I ever eat this? Why didn't I ever drink this? It was amazing. Limoncello, grappa, everything. It was just, everything was just like music to my, to my taste buds. (laughs) Um, The other first that I remember vividly because it was a pub right on the square in uh, Piazza Mino in, um, in Fiesole. And at the time, I forget the name of it now, it's called something completely different. It was a different name of a pub. But anyway, the the bartender in that pub was ta- spoke a bit of English, and his name was Max, or Massi. And he taught me my first sentence in Italian. And a sentence is very, very important for those that like to drink wine. Okay, listen up. He taught me the sentence, I would like a glass of red wine. (laughs) And those of you that know me, that's a very important sentence. A very important sentence that I needed to know immediately. And I needed to know the correct pronunciation, right? So the sentence is, vorrei un bicchiere di vino rosso. I'll say it again. Vorrei un bicchiere divino rosso and that became my my sentence probably for the next three months but like I the first few weeks I learned that I I really learned that and when I was out I tried as much as I could to speak Italian we did have an Italian teacher segueing into school she was not very um friendly (laughs) She was young and the guys like in my class, like they didn't really take it seriously. And kind of, if I look back now, I kind of see those um, other students, the the guys in my, in my class as the Italians I taught years later that just didn't want to learn because it didn't sound right. And they didn't like how it sounded. And that's where I felt that, that, that was hard. Because I really wanted to learn and I really want, and I, and I be, I didn't become friends with her, but the, the instructor, but she was, um, receptive with me, um, that I enjoyed that a lot. And I was really good trying to keep up with my homework and stuff. So, and that leads me to Vera, which I mentioned before. Vera was this tiny little Italian woman 
Oh, she was my art and architecture teacher. And I believe she taught at some other school um, in Florence. I can't remember now, but um, she has, you know, has passed uh, many years ago. Um, maybe a couple years after I, um, I studied abroad. She was, she was quite old. She was an older lady, but she was spunky. She spoke really good English. She had really great sayings. I can't remember them all. They're in my scrapbook and my journals, but like the one I remember her saying, cause we were, you know, a group of 12 following a little tiny Italian woman. She didn't carry the flower. Thank goodness um, for us to follow, but she was amazing. She taught me so much about art and architecture and the churches and the and the church that became my favorite church which I'll talk about later she showed me that church and it became my um my I, I want to say oasis but it came became a, actually my meditation uh meditation space let's say when I lived there and when I lived in Florence um later on so Vera would say <laughs> Vera would say when, because in Florence, those of you that have traveled to Florence or any type of big European city, um, you will see a big, big groups of like Japanese tourists, Chinese tourists, Korean, you know, huge groups of people and also Americans and English and Germans and everything. But the, the Japanese and the Chinese were ones that Vera would always mention, <laughs> And the reason why is because Itali um, the Japanese like and the Chinese and this is nothing against them at all, but it was just something that she noticed. And then I didn't I didn't notice until after living there, like how true it was. But because she, they would really be in like a group, like such a tight group trying to hear because they had the earplugs in and stuff. But then you would see them go in like a line and she would call them like and then walk into a different landmark or a different um, uh, church or um, piazza. They would be in this t this really tight, long line. And she would call them formiche, which is in English is ants. OK, and she probably meant this in a derogatory thing, which I don't mean it to be like that at all. But she would just say that's why she reminded me of my grandparents because she literally would say anything that was probably not politically correct and she, she just made us laugh because we're like Vera you shouldn't say that like for me that doesn't sound really good and she's like no no and she would just go off and but again she was an older woman we let her have a pass it was hilarious um so v that was Vera. Vera took us to all the really amazing churches, explained all the history just at the drop of a hat, knew all the dates. I mean, she just opened my world, opened my world. And I, wherever you are, Vera, I love you and I cherish your memory um, because you were amazing and taught me so much. Um, from there, like my study abroad experience really gave me the ability to be into independent and where I learned how to be myself. I was able to take the bus when I wanted. I, you know, knew how to buy a ticket. I knew how to take the train to different cities. It was something that I don't think a lot of us at a young age were able to do like, or, we're, we're told, hey, take the down, take the train by yourself to the city of Chicago, where I'm from. Like, you know, that wasn't something we're taught, you know. So living abroad for those three months, almost four months, really taught me how to be independent and really listen to my gut and trust that I'm going in the right direction. Um... I'm trying to think of the other things that really stand out. The other thing that I loved about being there, at least being in Florence at that time, because in, again, in 2002, there was no GPS. There was no cell phones. I mean, there were cell phones, but we didn't have them. Um, there was just a lot of like looking around. And this is what I say a lot, like in my, in my blog and on my website, Truly Italy, um, I loved 
loved getting lost in Florence. And what I mean by that is not like getting lost and you're like, oh my God, where the fuck am I? I'm sorry. I just swore, but it's okay. Not that, but like the fact that like I had a map. I didn't have the GPS. I had a map. I had to learn all the names of the streets that that those three months. Because there's a lot of tiny little alleyways, tiny little corridors that you just aren't taken on when you're in a big tour group. You're not. You're you're taken on the big main streets to see the big landmarks, to see the Ponte Vecchio, to see the Uffizi. Like you're not you you don't know those names of the streets and even my husband can attest to this because he's from Florence. He doesn't know all the street names of the streets. So I memorized my way of getting around Florence. And I take, I, I from the first time I arrived, I, I, I honor myself because when I first arrived, I had nothing but a map. And the map took me to places and streets and restaurants and stores and shops and boutiques and and little hole in the wall pubs like that's where I found um, also Joshua Tree. So the Joshua Tree pub, I'll lead into this because my friend Simone, who is still my friend, now will be almost 20 years that we're friends. He was in my wedding. Um, I actually found out about his pub from my friend Katie Lentz. Because she told me, oh my God, there's this rest, this is pub. He's, he owns this pub and he's so nice. He speaks English and it's so fun to go to. It's really small hole in the wall type of thing. I'm like, oh my God, well, we have to go. So I wrote down all these things before I left and, um, I made sure I went to all the places that Katie had told me. So when I first met Simone, like he was 27, (laughs) I'm not going to say how old he is now. He just had a birthday. Um, kind of longish hair, his friend Paolo, which my friend too, he was the bouncer, I would call him, but he was kind of the doorman, he would say. Um, Joshua Tree was owned by, um, at the time, Massi, his friend, and Simone, and Paolo was, has been Simone's friend for years, so they were all in business together, and that was it, and then there were a few other ladies that worked there, um, that I met, Rosie, who I still am friends with. Um, She's from Calabria, but she's now back in Calabria, and Flaviana, and Lara, and all those amazing people. I doubt they were listening to this because they, probably not, but it's okay. Um, But this pub became our place when I was studying abroad. One, because I turned 21 that spring semester. So I spent my spring semester, uh, my spring semester, my 21st birthday at at Joshua Tree, And the things I learned at Joshua Tree, and I'll go more into Joshua Tree. I think Joshua Tree could actually be a whole episode because I learned a lot being not just with drunk people, but learned a lot of Italian, learned a lot of customs, learned a lot of just culture um, by being at that pub. So Joshua Tree was one of the places that I met a lot of my friends who some of them are still my friends to this day. And Joshua Tree is funny because the new friends I met throughout my years of going back and forth and living, everyone knew where Joshua Tree was. And I'm like, what? I'm like, it doesn't seem like it's like a popular place. And I literally had so many friends come with me to Joshua Tree. And then it just became our hangout. Not always, but just we all knew people who knew Joshua Tree. That's what I meant to say. Um, So that was my place um, for nightlife, let's say. We did, there were some clubs, but I'm not going to go into that because I don't like clubs. And those of you that know me, I just don't. We won't talk about those. Um, But the other place that really stood out um, for me, the first year I was there, uh, the first, whatever, the first three months I was there, is Piazza della Signoria. Okay, Piazza della Signoria is one of those piazzas that to this day, whenever I walk into it, it just takes my breath away every single time. And I could probably start crying because I miss it so much. I miss everything about that piazza, the city, everything. 
the piazza inside the piazza there is the fake david which we would always we learn that from vera um the real david is in, is in the academia the museum yeah the la academia and there's a whole bunch of statues um there too i'm not going to get into that because Again, I'm not I'm not going to give you a history lesson on Florence. I'm just going to tell you about my experience and how much it's important for you to experience life and travel. So Piazza della Signoria had two, uh, sorry, one pub, which at the time was called Michael Collins Pub. And it had a restaurant right next door. There were other restaurants too, but for some reason I was drawn to this one restaurant. And this restaurant was called Lorenzaccio. And Lorenzaccio is no longer, it's not lo, no longer owned by the same family. It's owned by somebody else, but it's still there. It's just called by, it's called something else. I don't even know what it's called. Anyway, um, because the piazza is so tourist friendly, of course, everybody at Lorenzaccio speaks English, mostly. A menu ordering English, I guess I would say. Like, so, and um, so the first person I met there, his name was Giuseppe. And Giuseppe was a waiter that literally, he was, he was great. He was just the nicest man. He was older. <laughs> yes, he tried a few things with me later on. But yeah, anyway. Overall, he was a very genuinely nice person. And the other guys that I met through him that worked there um, became friends. And um, they are they are friends to this day. I don't talk to them as often as I would have if I was still living there. But they're still friends, I would consider. Michelangelo um, owned the restaurant with his brother. With his brother, sorry. And his, and his dad. His dad opened it in like the 1960s. Um, so yeah, they had everything. They had pizza, pasta, meat, salads, everything. Um, so yeah, that was our place. Um, well, our place, my place. I I liked going there by myself. I ended up, I did a lot of eating by myself at this time. And again, think about it. I'm 21 years old, 20 years old. And I would go to these places where I felt comfortable and that I could just gaze at the Palazzo Vecchio. I could look at the Neptune fountain and just people watch. I love people watching. If, if there's any people watchers out there, please, I hope you comment on this because <laughs> people watching is probably my favorite. And this is where I actually started writing. I wrote in my journals when I would have my, um, my solo lunches, my solo dinners, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it immensely. And I, again, I, I listened to the Italian all around me. It wasn't just English, especially in that restaurant. There were a lot of different languages that I heard. Um, but I did listen. And I think that was one of my other lessons in 2002 was to learn to listen more and not, you know, put in your two cents. So I listened a lot. <laughs> I listened a lot. And I couldn't, I, I, I never, I, I still miss to this day listening to Italian on the street. It was probably my one of my pastimes of just listening to people talk and seeing if I could understand what they were saying. Yeah, so my semester the my semester abroad was had a lot of adventures. Um one of the adventures was um we as let's see it was four of us, I believe. We booked a flight actually a package to London for four days. Okay. And back then, let's say, let's see, I was a flight. It was British Airways. It wasn't like a crappy airline. It was British Airways. And like the hotel was okay. It was next to the Bayswater Metro, a tube stop. Sorry, that's my English coming out. Um, It was okay. It was just to sleep. So we were okay with it. But I think we spent like maybe 200 euro. I think it was probably like that maybe less, maybe less. I I can't remember. It wasn't that expensive. I remembered. I remember that. And for the fact of it being four days, it was just like an easy flight. That was really fun. We, We had so much fun. 
Um, the other place that we went for our, let's see, our spring break was in Falonica, which I don't remember it being really fun because it wasn't really good weather. We couldn't really go to the beach and our spring break was in March and in March it's still really cold on the seaside. So we didn't get to go swimming. I think we went to the beach once, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything fun. The one trip I do remember that I will, I still have all the pictures and everything. It was amazing. A bunch of us um, took the train to Cinque Terre and we spent the weekend um, walking the the four lands. Cinque Terre means four lands. And there's these, it's, um, no, Cinque, not four lands, five lands. I'm sorry. Cinque is five. Um, the... The experience there was very much backpack. Let's let's grab my backpack. We were all sleeping kind of on top of each other in these tiny little apartments. But oh my God, were they the cutest apartments ever? They were so cute and like cost nothing, like 15 euro a night, which is like 10, 15 dollars at the time. Actually, at the time, I forgot to mention this. At the time, in 2002, that was the first year they had the euro okay Italians did not know what to do with change I I will I might talk about this in a different episode but so the euro was almost equal to the dollar so it was like freaking crazy obviously not now but it was it was insane anyway so we went we walked let's see we walked from Rio Maggiore which was the first town to Manarola Manarola we walked I don't know if we walked all the way to Cornelia. I think we did because that was the longest. Oh my God, that one was three hours of walking up and down these hills, these cliffs. Oh my God. I have pictures, but they do not do it justice. They do not. We, and this again was, I think, gosh, was this in March too? This might have been in March. So we were all in like, and I think it was a little warmer. It was probably closer to April. I think it was and so we were all in shorts and it was probably like 60 degrees but when we got up into the mountains we were walking like it got chilly so we all had like cardigans and cardigans like fleeces and stuff like that so um I'm gonna tell you this one story and then I probably am gonna end it because I can go on and on and this will be like a five hour um first podcast episode um <laughs> so this one story so I'm gonna tell you we we're walking on this path and at the time the path to um to Cornelia from Manarola the third town is Cornelia was open okay right now I don't think it's open because there's a lot of landslides there's a lot of mudslides and all that stuff so I don't think it's open but at the time we could walk all the way and that's the one that took us three three and a half hours I don't know it was like freaking long we were tired hungry oh my gosh um on the way we run into, we were obviously talking in English and there's this guy that stops and he turns around and he's like, Hey, you guys American. We're like, Oh yeah. And we start talking a little bit and he's like, Oh yeah, I'm from California. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, we're like, Oh cool, cool. And we just like chit chatted about like what he was doing and traveling. He was traveling all over Europe. And then we parted ways and that was that. So we stayed the night in Cornelia, uh, probably four or five of us for like 20 euro a night guys. That was like 20 bucks. We spent 20 bucks on just an apartment. And if I could show you the picture of my friend Angie um, just sitting on the terrace, like looking out with her coffee. Oh, my God. It was breathtaking. Breathtaking. So that day, so we spent the night in Cornelia. The next day, we walked to Vernazza. Now, Vernazza, again, this is back in 2002. All of the towns were accessible by these walking paths. Not always very <laughs> safe to in my and when I think back, I don't think I would have done it because it, it, it just would have freaked me out. But I did it because we were all together and we were like risking life and adventure and we were 20 and it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, so we walked all the way to Vernazza, which is the fourth town. Vernazza is a beautiful town. They were all beautiful. Vernazza has a little tiny beach. So that's where we ended up hanging out like relaxing afterwards because I think that was a pretty long walk as well we had delicious food and then I'm still finishing this other story we were talking about so we were like wading in the water putting our feet in the water and this little beach and all of a sudden this guy comes up to me and he said oh my god are you are you from the St. Mary's 
in California because I had my St. Mary's um, soccer shirt on from St. Mary's in Winona, Minnesota. I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm, we're from Minnesota, the school in Minnesota. He's like, oh, hey, I just met you guys on the path. And we're, I'm like, oh my God, it's, yeah, it's in, I, I forgot his name. I'm like, what was your name again? He's all, it's Dan. I'm like, oh, hey, Dan. And so we start talking and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm just renting this kayak. Does anyone want to take a ride over to Monta Rosa? And Monta Rosa in the kayak, I could see Monta Rosa. So I'm like, oh my God, it's not that far and stuff. And I immediately, without a beat, I said, yes. And my friends looked at me and like, Katie, what are you doing? I'm like, what? I had my big backpack. Okay, think of the biggest backpack a backpacker would have, okay? Because we didn't do laundry this whole weekend, okay? It's just a bunch of clothes, shoes packed into this pack. Like, it's huge. It was was heavy, too. So Dan's like, okay, great. And he pulls out the uh, the kayak, and um, he's like, okay, go ahead and sit down. I'll, I'll paddle since you have your bag. And I'm like... I'm like, oh, okay, but where's your bag? He's like, oh, all my stuff's in Monta Rosa, I'm in, uh, Monta Rosa because I already had, that's where I got the kayak. I'm like, oh, perfect. So my friends like literally looked at me. They thought they were like, you're going to get kidnapped. You're going to get killed. And they're like, I don't, we don't know if you're going to see, I'm, we're going to see you again, Katie. I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, it's fine. Oh my God, he's so nice. And, and they're like, what? You don't even know him. I'm like, it's fine. His name's Dan and he's from California. And they're like, what? All right, fine. Bye. Hope does not see you like, you know, your body in the water as we're walking over. And I'm like, okay. So again, I'm going to paint the picture for you. Get into the kayak. The ba- My bag is on my leg. So my legs are extended out for my yogis in Dandasana. <laughs> so my bag is resting on my legs. And I literally am, we're just on the surface of the water. Okay, it's a kayak. Dan's behind me. He's starting to paddle and we start talking. And I learn a little bit about himself. I learn that his birthday is the same as mine, March 18th. I'm like, oh my God, it's like meant to be. And um, I also notice, without freaking out, all all these jellyfish everywhere in the water. Jellyfish. Not big ones, not like the manta ray, manta war. That's the ones that have the like dangly tentacles. Just regular jellyfish, tiny ones, baby ones, all over, all over the place. And I'm like, oh my God, Dan, there's all these jellyfish. He's like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's fine. We're going to be fine. He's like, it literally takes 15 minutes to get over there. I'm like, okay. And without a beat, like we're talking and talking. All of a sudden we're at the shore. And I'm like, oh my God, it took 15 minutes. An hour and 45 minutes later, I see my friends exhausted, hungry, tired walk out of the path and I'm sitting on the beach with Dan and we're just talking they're like oh my god how did you you're alive and they were like so like surprised I'm like oh my god so that was my tr- that was my story about Cinque Terre and I will never forget that story because it was one of the stories that made me risk life and be in an adventure state and trust somebody that I didn't necessarily think I could trust because I didn't know him but it was an incredible experience because I just leaned in with my gut and just said hey I don't want to walk anymore (laughs) my legs were tired I was exhausted I just wanted to sit and like and I love boats oh did I not mention that I love boats any type of boat so I took him up on it and then I don't I don't regret it um yeah so that's a little bit about me. Um, I hope you enjoyed this first episode. I really hope to enlighten you and, and, and share with you a lot of the stories that I have from living abroad, um, both like permanently and as like a three month stints. Cause I did a lot of three month stints and like six month stints, nine month stints that I stayed in Florence in different types of job, um, in different types of jobs and stuff. And then I'll, I'll get, I'll finally, I will get to the point where I moved abroad legally and got my residency and everything. And it was amazing. Um, but thank you for listening. And if you know of anybody that would like to listen to this, and this is something that might lighten them up to, to really take this, take the leap and move abroad or, 
travel abroad and do it alone or go to a study abroad program, anything. Just I please share this with them because that's what I really, my intention is to get you excited about travel again and to get you excited about taking that first step into adventure and um, listening to your gut, trusting what you already know and and being open, being open to a lot of amazing, beautiful things that are in this world. Thanks for listening. I am beyond grateful for you listening to my podcast right now. I am so excited to share my journey of living abroad and all of my stories of Florence and Italy and all the places in between that I've visited. If this has reached you in any way and you would like to continue, please subscribe now. Also, go check out my website, trulyitaly.tours, for all my travel experiences. Ci si vede. Ciao.